Okay, so let's uh, start the second session. And in this second session, uh, uh, Professor Ranjini Bandavade from Ramadi Research Institute will talk about something. I forgot the title. <laughs> okay, thank you, Anupam. Thank you, Urna. So uh, I have very little math in my talk, but I do have a lot of chemistry and I have particles escaping out of wells. But uh, first, we'll start with farm animals. Okay, so we'll start with this analogy. So you see lots of sheep here, okay? So they are grazing, they are in every which direction they could point in, and they are not likely to go home by on their own. So you need the sheep dogs, okay? Who are going to drive them home. So we have basically created the same scenario in our lab, but scaled down by about six decades in length scale, okay? So we work with colloidal particles, and I'm going to tell you today about some experiments we did with active colloidal particles that were dispersed in a crowded environment of bidispersed but passive uh, colloidal particles. Okay, so the work was done with my students Palak and Ridhika and Sanjay who started the work but who submitted his thesis a month ago. Okay, so you've heard of Janus particles, Janus the Greek god, okay, the, with one face facing the Looking into the looking at the future, one uh, one one face looking into the past, and he's the god of gateways and bridges. Uh, we make particles in the lab that look a lot like Janus, so they have two different. Uh, they have chemically modified surfaces. Uh, there are two hemispheres with completely different chemical uh, um, uh, conformations. So we start off with glass, okay, which we clean. And then we put polystyrene particles of about two microns diameter. We put a drop of that on the glass slide. And then we spin coat it at very, very high speed. So basically with spin coating the drop of uh, colloids, they spread out into a monolayer, okay? So 1,000 RPMs at f for 50 seconds to create a monolayer. And then we use a sputtering technique, okay, which is like a metal vapor deposition technique. So here we use platinum to cover the exposed face of faces of the uh, colloidal particles that we have on our monolayers, okay? So as a result of this, we have one hemisphere of the colloidal particles that are covered with platinum, okay? And the other, the other face, which is not facing the, the vapor, that's still polystyrene, so this is called a masking technique, okay? And as a result of this sputtering, we get five nanometer uh, thickness, uh, uh, platinum coating, okay, on one side of the faces of these polystyrene particles, okay? Okay, so what happens when you put these Janus particles in water? Nothing happens, but then if you put them in, in hydrogen peroxide, a lot happens. So uh, platinum, so this is the Janus particle, so this red face here is the, the platinum face, and when we put this in water, like I said, nothing happens, but when we put it in peroxide, the platinum here acts as a catalyst, okay? So the platinum acts as a catalyst and it de decomposes the peroxide into water and oxygen, okay? So as a result of the gradient in the concentration of the materials around the particle, the particle zooms in the forward direction, okay? So it self-propels. Um, so to make sure, so you know, this is the chemistry that we had to do. And just to make sure that it was all coated very nicely, we have used a method of elemental analysis which is available with, with us called X-ray dispersive spectroscopy. And we see that uh, there is indeed platinum that has been coated on our particles. Um, the coating is not the same. So the, because you know, this is a real experiment that we are doing here. But then uh, we do try to take out the particles that don't look so good. So we make the particles, we have to dry the particles, okay? Then we look at them and then, of course, it's a difficult task, but the yield is very, very poor, okay? So you can actually look at particles, okay? We can't tell you very much about the thickness except that the average is five nanometers, okay? Now the particles which have not been coated, we have to throw them away. And the assumption here is that the average velocity is the same in all cases. I'll show you some videos. Okay, so um, 
Okay, so <laughs> I mean, okay. So basically, one huge problem with these experiments is that uh, the evolution of the oxygen bubbles, and considering that we want to look at the motion of these particles under a microscope, it's very difficult to do this for very long lengths of time because of the oxygen evolution. Okay, so we had to do an experiment, which we have all probably done in our uh, high school, which is. Uh, we had to, before we started the experiment, so I'm just telling you about the checks and balances we had to do. We had to measure the amount of oxygen that is produced, okay, when you put the particles in a peroxide solution. So this is for about a 2.5% peroxide uh, solution. So this is mixed in a water D2O uh, mixture, uh, just, you know, for, for uh, density matching. And then by downward displacement, it's, it's by downward displacement of water, we see that the oxygen evolution rate, this is the highest around up to five minutes. And then you can see that the oxygen evolution rate goes down. So that is where we decide to conclude our experiments. So all our experiments, they are for very limited times. Okay, so these are the videos that we captured. So each one goes on for two minutes, but I'm not going to show you that. Okay, so the, the video that you see on the left, this, these are Janus particles, but there's no hydrogen peroxide here. There's no fuel. So these particles, they are basically just diffusing around in an H2O, D2O mixture. And we have to make a mixture of uh, H2O and D2O because Janus particles have a density of uh, 1.05. Okay, so we don't want them to sediment. Um, so I'll just uh, play this video. So you see, I mean, there is a, some random motion, but there's no directional motion. Okay, it's stopped there. Now, if I do the, for the other one, if you look at certain particles, so here we have peroxide in the medium. Okay, if you look at this particle, for instance, I'll play it again, oops. Let's do it from here. So you can see that the particles, they do have some directional motion, okay? So then we look at the center, so this is, so here the our suspensions are dilute enough that you can consider them as single particles. So we look at the trajectories of each particle, okay? We find the mean square displacement by averaging over all the particles that you see here. So we've done this for about 20 particles, and then here is the mean square displacement that we have. So this is over about 10 seconds. Remember I told you that the longest we can do the experiment is for five minutes, but then we stopped at 10 seconds because of the huge amount of data that, you know, it's already, and as you can see, our time resolution is very good because that experiment was done in bright field microscopy. So we were looking at, you know, 20 frames per second, but then this was enough. So uh, the different uh, traces that you see here, these are for, uh, uh, well, the same amount of Janus particles, but different amounts of fuel, which was the peroxide in the, uh, in the solvent mixture. And this is as the uh, amount of peroxide goes up, you can see that initially the motion looks ballistic, okay? And after, after that, it seems to become diffusive. And I'll just, uh, uh, I, I, I'll just uh, magnify the first part of the plot, okay? So that you can actually see this curvature but we can do better than that. We can also fit it. So we estimate the dynamics of a single particle, okay, by uh, this very famous equation that has been used a lot. So this is the mean square displacement versus time plot for one of the peroxide uh, uh, mixtures that we had, and we fitted it to this model. So as you can see, we fitted it only for, you know, the, the I mean, two different, I mean, for very short time limits and for the long time limits. So, uh, so in the very short time lim limit, you know, you do get ballistic behavior, but as you can see, the range of fitting here is not much. That is just an experimental difficulty, because like I told you, we cannot achieve very high frame rates in this particular uh, geometry. And now for the higher time scales, which is the longer time scales, okay, so you can actually, you do get a I mean, you, you do get the diffusive motion back, except that the diffusion coefficient, this is now replaced by an effective value, which is an enhanced value of the diffusion. Okay, and uh, again, this is the short time scale data to show this fit. The fit that is green here appears red here. Okay, so now we really want to make a crowded 
a very crowded environment of these uh, polystyrene particles. And in that crowded environment, we want to put a very small amount of active particles. So by crowded, I mean, I mean, it's a jammed environment. So you could think of it in terms of a colloidal glass with ultra slow dynamics. But what happens to this glass, this colloidal glass with ultra slow dynamics, if you put a very little amount of activity in the midst, okay? so. Uh, so, if, so we have made these dense bidispersed uh, suspensions of polystyrene particles. So these are suspensions in just water and D2O. So there are two, two sizes. So one is 2.07 microns and the other is 3.87 microns. We make mixtures of these, okay? And initially we put them just in water and D2O. Nothing happens, okay? So because these, are, these mixtures are made, you know, they are dispersed in water but at very high concentrations, they just show caged motion. Okay, but then we put H2O, okay? And the moment we put H2O, you have this catalytic reaction, okay, because of the presence of the platinum, the peroxide decomposes into water and uh, oxygen, and you see a cage breaking phenomenon. Now these are, these have been shown uh, in, in, I mean, so simulations have shown this, but then uh, we try to recreate the situation in an experiment, okay? so that it doesn't crystallize. Yes. What happens if it ages in They don't. They have a, uh, no, so, okay, sorry? So if the cage in itself, mm -hmm. is it no longer moving? Uh, no, they do jiggle around in their cages, but they do not stick because there is a screened electrostatic repulsion. So see, these are polystyrene uh, spheres. So you know, there are these, they have the ch these charged uh, Debye layers of sodium ions. So they'll not stick together. Okay, so um, before I get to our data and you know, the way we did our experiments, I'm gonna show you about some uh, previous experiments. So uh, previous theoretical work with uh, active particles, but you know, a collection of active particles. So these are some event-driven Brownian dynamics uh, simulations by Rand Nee et al, which came out now seven years ago. So they had these active particles, okay? So they had these particles with, and each particle was acted upon by a, by a force, okay? By, by, by a force, which itself, you know, it could, it, uh, yeah, so basically each particle had, and it, I mean, the force could, you know, it, so, yeah, so it had a, a self-propulsion force, and they, uh, they calculated the trajectories of the particles, they calculated the overlap functions, got the relaxation times out, and they saw that as the self-propulsion forces increased, you can see that the time scales go down. Okay, so there is a fluidization of the suspension, and they did this for several different volume fractions, and the trajectories, basically, so they evolved as a result of drag forces, okay, this force F here, and excluded volume interactions. And you can see fluidization, so this is as the force goes up, I'm sorry, you can't quite see the F here. So as the force goes up, you can see that the time scales are going down, and the slowing down is also getting delayed. And based on their simulations, they drew this uh, phase diagram. So this, this black trace that you see here, so this is the, okay, so I mean, this is not quite a phase diagram. I mean, these are just the, okay. So this is the mean square displacement versus time. And uh, this black trace that you see here, this is in the case when uh, there is uh, no activity at all. And you can see the, the plateau in the del, del, square, del R square uh, plot which means that you do have caging, but when you have, and you can see the particles here, so, uh, so if you're in this caged regime, so you can see these particles that are kind of, you know, constrained together in this background of semi-transparent particles, okay? So it's a very jammed environment, but the moment you had a force, you can see that uh, at the longer times, these clusters are breaking up, okay? So the system has fluidized as a result of that self-propulsion force. Now closer to what, closer to the scenario that we are about to uh, recreate was the, the, were the experiments that came out of the group of Chandan Dasgupta et al. So they used a Cove-Anderson uh, mixture, okay, of 80% of one particle and 20% of the other particles and a very small fraction of these A particles, these were active, okay, and these particles, they evolved under the Leonard jones pair potential and they calculated the 
mean square displacement versus the time. And again, they see that as, as the activity goes up in this direction, okay, the sample fluidizes. And uh, so basically, you know, I mean, so they have also gotten many other, uh, you know, they, they have calculated relaxation times and all that, but I didn't really want to show a lot of uh, details. But then they have summed up their data in terms of this phase diagram in the, in the temperature and the active force plane. And you can see that for low temperatures and low forces, you have a glass phase as temperature or the active force increases, you go to the liquid-like state, okay? The only experiment we could find on activity, you know, what activity does to a, to a jammed, uh, uh, well, I mean, a jammed system, okay, are these stack particle experiments from the group of David Waits, okay, that came out in Cell in 2014. So they were basically looking at the cytoplasm of a live cell, and they were looking at the dynamics by means of tagged particle diffusion. And as you know, the, the cell is a, you know, it has a highly active environment, right, with molecular motors, you know, there's a, there's a lot of stuff going on there. So when they just looked at the cell without doing anything at all, they looked at the mean square displacement of the tagged particle versus the, the time, they saw that, you know, so delta, I mean, so, so they had something that looked like this. You can see that the time scales here, you know, they are a lot faster, but when they inhibited the myosin, Okay, you can already see that the a cage is beginning to develop. Okay, and when they depleted the ATP, because these molecular motors, they basically hydrolyze the ATP, right, to be able to become active. So therefore, then you just get a plateau. Okay, so. Hot squared actually does mean approach to plateau Yes, okay, okay. In these ones, maybe. Okay. See, they just say that you know this is the difference that happens if you suppress activity, and the lesson being that you know the active force fluctuations can fluidize the jam suspension. So I mean, there are problems of doing experiments for very long time scales also. So. That these are two different experiments. So they have deplete, they have inhibited the myosin by using some uh, some material that I'm not. So these are two different experiments. Stop the you stop the molecular motor. No, no. So these are two different things. So ATP depletion basically, you know, it slows down the dynamics much more. So and what the author says, you know, these things have a lot of uh, uh, implications in, for instance, the metabolism of when the cell is metabol metabolizing. Because when the cell is metabolizing, you find that the force fluctuations increase a lot. So they're in the same paper, they've done these uh, uh, force spectroscopy, force fluctuation spectroscopy measurements where they show that. Okay, so we'll come to our experiment now. So how do we make our dense suspensions? So uh, we want to do our experiments in a confocal geometry. So we take two kinds of colloidal particles, but which flores? Uh, with two different colors. So one, so one of the colloidal particles, these polystyrene particles, which we also, so we take some of these and we coat them into Janus particles to make Janus particles, okay? So these are about two microns in size and we mix these with larger particles that are about 3.87 microns in size and these flores in the green, okay? So our confocal microscope has a helium neon laser as well as an argon ion laser. So therefore, you can, you can visualize your particles very well and you can track them individually. Now, because some of our red particles are Janus particles, we look at the mean square displacement of this very crowded environment just by tracking thousands and thousands of the green particles. Okay, so we have these, we mix these three kinds of particles together. The platinum coated Janus particles, the concentrations are very low. If you go to high concentrations, there are problems. For instance, you know, they sometimes phase separate. Okay, that's a big problem. If the activity is too much, you have oxygen bubbles all over and you can't quite visualize anything. So we had to be a bit conservative. The, uh, the activity that we have here are much lower than the activity that has been used in say the the theory or the simulation papers. Now we put these, we mix all these particles in different ratios. 
in a little bit of water and then we ultrasonicate them for homogeneous mixing. So the size ratios of these particles here is 1.87 and we've kept this ratio fixed. It's about 0.76 and then we centrifuge the particles at 8000 RPM for about 20 minutes. Okay, we, we discard the, the water, we mix it in water and D2O and we make a very dense suspension, a bidispersed suspension and I will be showing you data where the concentration of the colloids or the volume fraction of the colloidal phase is about 0.58. Okay, so very, very jammed suspension. And we do our experiments in a geometry such as this. So just to give you an idea, so see, because there's a, so you need to be able to maintain a constant flow of the hydrogen peroxide. Because, you know, I mean, hydrogen peroxide, uh, you, it, it gets extinguished very fast because of the activity. So then we have this, we make this on a microscope slide. Okay, so uh, we do the experiment here because Janus particles typically if you do these experiments you'll see that the yields are extremely poor. So for all the work that you put in you actually get a few particles. Hmm? So, so this is basically in our little geometry that we have here. This is a two centimeter square kind of a cross section. This is the well where we do the experiment. The H2O2 comes in from here. Okay, you have some activity that is generated here. We focus our microscope here and we look at the trajectories and we also have an H2O2 outlet here, okay? But then the H2O2, uh, the, well, the speed of injection of the H2O2 has to be extremely low because you do not want any flow inside the well, okay? Because sometimes it's very frustrating because you look under the microscope and you can see everything moving. So obviously we've had, you know, all kinds of failures, but I'm not going to, whatever I'm showing you is not based on those, that, that data. And just to put it in perspective, oops. So this is what it looks like. So these are uh, microfluidic channels. So we have uh, a glass slide and we make the channels out of uh, PDMS. So this is where we do our experiments. And this is the well here, little well. I can pass it around later, okay? Okay, so we use a confocal microscope, yes? So what are the, uh, the, water? the water, yeah, see, you can't really do very much about it, but because we have an outlet, you see the oxygen anyway, the oxygen will go, you know, it'll, it doesn't stay in the well. So, I mean, there have been cases of oxygen bubbles getting trapped, we just discard that data. We do have an outlet, okay? So this outlet that we have here, that's where all the peroxide and the, the, the water that is, you know, the excess water that will all go out that way. Okay, so we use a confocal microscope just because we want to differentiate the two particles. Like I told you, we took fluorescent spheres. Okay, so you can, uh, so with two different emissions and I will show you the pictures in a moment. And then we follow particles over several frames. So the best frame rates that we have here are only about one per second. But we can actually manage with that because, you know, we have a very jammed environment and we are looking at the very slow dynamics of particles. Okay, and then so we look at the center of mass motion of each particle through many, many frames. We average over lots of particles and we get the mean square displacement out. Okay, so here are some videos. So this is when, so you see the red and the green. Okay, so the green particles are the larger particles, the red particles are the smaller two micron particles. But, uh, uh, you know, so the red particles also include a very small fraction of the active particles. And I'm going to play a video. So I'm going to, I'm playing the video. I don't know if you can make it out. Is it even playing? No, uh, yeah, it was playing. It's so slow, you can't even make it out. Okay, so you see, I mean, maybe if you look, you see that, you know, particles are moving, but they are moving so minutely and so slowly, you can hardly see it. Okay. These are particles and they're actually, there are no active particles here. So actually there are active particles there, but there's no peroxide. See, because we wanted to recreate the exactly same uh, samples, yeah. So there are active particles, but there's no activity because there's no peroxide. So, and here, the next one, so this one has peroxide, and you can see some motion here. And of course, you know, rather than looking at it visually, it's always good to calculate mean square displacements. I think it's still going on. So the problem here is, no, it is not. Actually, see, these are all the red particles, but see, the contrast really changes if you put H2O2. 
So these are still things we are working on, you know, these are very challenging, but then uh, the densities are the same and actually it also I've seen, it looks much better outside, it also depends on the contrast of the, the computer. I don't think I can change it now. I see it better here, for instance, it looks really bad there in my defense. So, so anyway, there is some more motion here. And uh, so this is for a particular, uh, uh, particular concentration of peroxide in the mixture. We've done this at many, many concentrations. Okay, so, uh, and this is our data. So this, these black squares that you see here, this is the data. When we had, you know, so these are all for the identical samples, okay. Uh, no, they are actually not, I'm sorry about that. So this is for a sample, a bidispersed suspension of uh, volume fraction 0.58, but with no active particles at all, but with a constant amount of peroxide. So unlike in the previous uh, videos that I showed you where we had activity, we had active particles, but no fuel. Here we have uh, the same amount of fuel, but we've increased the amount of active particles. And here you can see, so this is when you have no active particles at all. You can see that the mean square displacements are, well, I mean, much smaller. And they do evolve with time, and I wouldn't take this seriously because I think this is where, at the very long times, this is where flow makes a big difference, okay? And that is where we stop the experiment. And now here, the second, these red circles that you see here, uh, so these are basically at uh, an active particle concentration of about 1%. And there you can see, okay, so the one thing is, you know, you do not really see caging here because, uh, because of the kind of time scales that we have to work with. But then when you do increase the amount of active particles, you see that the, uh, the mean square displacements have become much larger. You increase the active particle uh, volume fraction further, the mean square displacement increases even more, okay? So the... Uh, lesson of this, the message that this gives you is that yes, experimentally you can show that there is something such as active fluidization, okay? So you have a bidispersed jam suspension, just put a few active particles in there and you can fluidize your suspension. I'm at conclusions already, okay? <laughs> so, uh, so we synthesize Janus particles, so I've given a similar uh, uh, talk earlier, but then now we've learned how to actually increase the yield of the Janus particles. So, I mean, much of the data looks the same, but it's of, I would say, better quality. And we've looked at their MSDs with varying uh, degrees of activity. So the fluidization of suspensions of densely packed by dispersed polystyrene particles was achieved by adding activity. A cage breaking phenomena as predicted in theoretical models was observed. Now, there are many things we can do now. So we are also trying to make other kinds of active particles. For instance, you can make these, these carbon particles, okay? You can cover particles with carbon, and if you just shine a laser on them from one direction, okay, you can actually see activity. And people have used these to look at, for instance, active sedimentation. And the good thing about these particles is you get much better yields, okay? So these are all there. There are some very interesting things that we can now look at. For instance, the clustering of these Janus particles. For that, we need better yields, which we are trying to get at, okay? So uh, now, now that we have the, the, the center of mass trajectories, we can now calculate overlap functions, we can get time scales out, we can calculate fragilities very like, you know, what people have done earlier. And uh, so for, that's for the fragility, we can also look at higher order correlation functions, we can look at dynamical heterogeneities, we can see how the glass is fluidized exactly. Okay, and of course we'll also change the activity, we'll change the amount of fuel, I mean there's a lot to be done. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Ranjini. Questions? Come. So by, by studying the mean square displacement of these active particles, get a length pull out, I mean, maybe that is a big problem. So that's one of the big problems with that, like what is the length of the Yes, yes. Uh, we can get a time scale out. Uh, I don't know, I mean, yeah, I'm. Uh, the correlation length, I don't know. I mean, I guess you can. I mean, once you have the data, I mean, we can. Okay. There is kind of caging. Right. So, I mean, what you have here, of course, it's included, mm -hmm. but then at very late time, mm -hmm. of course, there is still caging because it mm -hmm. can't go out. Very sure. Much. See, I mean, if you look at a say chi four, for instance, a higher order correlation function. 
we haven't really worked on this data, but you know, you do see peaks. So that's what I meant by dynamical. You know, like it's the it's some kind of length scale of correlated motions, but uh, a static length scale. And how does it depend on the size of these dynamic particles? And you put the red one, then the smaller one. Right. Right. I don't think the trends will change. The trends will not change, but enhance what more? The of course, yes, of course. So the other way of doing it is by changing the amount of fuel or by changing the amount of activity. So, so suppose I, I take such a dense uh, suspension of colloids so that there is a bit there is jamming, mm -hmm. and and now I, I take one large nut inside mm -hmm. this suspension, mm -hmm. will I be able to see the, this Brazilian nut phenomenon that it will rise because I have the Janus particles? Uh, see, the Brazil nut uh, phenomenon, so I mean, that is something you see in granular media, you know, because the friction at the surfaces is what really drives it. So you don't have it in colloids, this Brazilian no, no, nut? No, colloids are too small. I see. So the before Brazil nut, you need uh, well but, bigger particles. But you particles. take a big nut in the colloids and you make them fluidize by Ioannis particles. You, you could. Do not I mean, at least that. locally, it would fluidize. But it would make me make rise maybe a bigger particle inside. That it would go. Sure. Up. Yeah. But then I, you cannot do it with the colloidal particles. No, but a big yeah. one, a ping yeah. pong ball in a colloidal suspension, mm -hmm. it's trapped by the colloids. But I don't think so. See, because oh, I mean, okay. uh, the segregation usually happens by two mechanisms. Okay, so I mean, if you even look at segregation, you know, if you're driving it, for instance, okay, so um, it's usually because of void filling. So because, you know, when you're uh, driving something, it expands, right? And therefore, the small particles, they'll fall through, mm -hmm. okay? The, or, I mean, so that is one possibility, which is why the big particle will rise. The other way you can do, the other reason why segregation happens is because of convection, convective motions. So this is a suspension. So these are all colloids, you know, this is in a medium. So I think the damping is far too much to see anything of okay. the kind. But in general, I would think that in many cases, shaking can mm. be replaced by maybe introducing Janus or active particles. Sure, for, yeah, I mean, this is a, of course a driven system and I'm yeah. sure, I mean, there, there are, I mean, you do get phase separations of active particles, you know, at high enough concentrations if the driving is too large. Uh, I mean, it's much more difficult because as you see, we've actually done a two-dimensional tracking. And the active particles, they move much more than the passive particles. So there's always this danger that they'll go out of plane. I mean, this is confocal, so you can actually track them out of plane, but you know, uh, confocal systems, usually the Z-scan is much slower. And that, that is why we made the smaller particles, that is why we are tracking the bigger particles and we made the smaller particles the active particles because we wanted to track as many of the bigger particles as possible. Which, which simulation? I showed two. Huh. Right. Perhaps, but I mean the active particle fraction was extremely low. In the simulation, they could have, easy, yeah, right? sure. I don't know if will it they, be different. They or? should have, but they haven't. So I mean, unlike so, we have only so if, if for a two-component mixture, we've only looked at one of the components, right? So they have looked at both the components. So, what's the, what's yeah, the, both are similar. Both are similar. Yeah. In simulation, why did they use two components? So that it doesn't crystallize. See, because I mean, some of the data is at extremely low active forces. So therefore, you know, just to bypass crystallization, you have to use this, you know, this Cobb-Anderson mixture and yeah. So there are these uh, very set, you know, number distributions, I mean, number ratios and size ratios that you have to work on if you want to end up with a jam system. So in the experiment, like when you take the video, you stop the peroxide flow. No, no, the peroxide flow is happening. But then, but then it is happening flow. so slow. Oh, okay. It is happening so slow that you just pray that, you know, it is not... Uh, I mean, you cannot see it, see, because if there is flow, you can actually see all the, you know, things actually moving out of your uh, field of view. But so, and the, the flow rate, I don't know if I mentioned it, that's 34 uh, microns per minute, 
Okay, so it's extremely slow, but you have to keep replenishing it because the platinum is only five nanometers. Okay, and I mean it just uh, yeah, we have to keep replenishing it. That's why we had to make that fancy channel with the you know the the Y shaped channel with the wells and all that. More questions? If not, let's thank Anjini once again. Okay. Thank you.